Okay, we're going to, uh, in this session, we will look more specifically at uh, corporations. Uh, and when we say that, of course, we're thinking about for-profit organizations, but, you know, I think uh, the principles apply pretty equally uh, to, um, uh, to non-profits as well, although they tend to be, have a different perspective anyway, they're not uh, hindered by the uh, a more narrow focus on the, uh, on the profit, but, you know, they also have their own issues to deal with. Um, so, this uh, is really uh, taken from a, uh, from a uh, conference paper that I prepared a year, a year ago, just trying to, uh, to use it as a way of showing the tension that exists between public needs and the, uh, and the, uh, corporations and how they can address that. Uh, I've handed out, incidentally, uh, oh, here. anybody who needs their copies of the, uh, the handouts for each of these, these slides. And so the objective, essentially, is employing social systems analysis. And this comes directly from the social process triangles that, um, that were developed by the Order of Manigault back in the 70s. And uh, the reason why this whole issue has become very personal for me was <clears throat> when Mary Ann and I first uh, were in Chicago with the Order of Medical in the 70s, I just signed out, and I just ended up with Sears Rola uh, as their international attorney. And uh, what I discovered, to my great surprise, was that Sears was a revolutionary activity in Latin America with the retailing industry and the mass merchandising turned the retail industry around completely, just like that done in the United States. And uh, it was doing a lot of developmental, economic developmental activity in all the countries it was at because it was in effect outsourcing. And it was providing quality standards. It was probably marketing capability to hundreds of small firms who otherwise could never reach the market. And it wasn't doing this because it wanted to be a really a socially responsible corporation. Yeah, they had a reputation to protect, but they were doing this because this is the way they did business. And that's really the theme of this, of, of mine, is that that's what companies should be looking at, the way they do business. Um, and that there are ways of doing business uh, that can be um, uh, improved on in a way that doesn't cost that much more, but can have an enormous uh, social benefits. And so that's the idea of, a, of, a, of a, uh, a corporate audit, corporate social audit, in order to see how that could happen. Um, so the idea of the systems analysis then, using the social process and the corporate process triangles, is to enable to create an awareness among corporations that corporate social responsibility is integral to societal development. That is, their, their, um, their uh, actions, and that to better align enterprise operations with social needs. Uh, and I say that specifically now, um, well, I'll talk about that in a second, but the theoretical underpinnings of this is that the business of business is social service. Now, that's not revolutionary. Actually, Peter Drucker said that back in the in the 50s, he said, that's what you do. You provide a service, people like the service, they buy the service, you then provide more service. And you continue to add to those services and expand services, and if they buy it, you know, then that is, that's a pretty good indication that they like it. Um, and then, of course, is, um, so it's, that's the basic, is that it's social service. And I, in my classes, anyway, if you ask students, MBA students, you know, uh, what do you think is the end goal of businesses? And I'll say, make a profit. Well, <clears throat> my response to that is uh, that, by, uh, that profits are a byproduct of the social service that they provide. And the better they provide it, you know, the, uh, the better, the more likely they are to make a profit. Now, of course, there are other ways to make profits, speculatively and so forth. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, it seems to me you can build a, a case on social service and that profits are a byproduct. Um, a necessary byproduct, though, you know, businesses don't run on losing money, uh, or they don't last long. And uh, private enterprises, dynamics, are a mirror image of society. 
So corporations are merely uh, social uh, systems uh, writ small. And uh, then aligning enterprise operations, social um, needs yield societal benefits and, and as well as enterprise benefits. So the, both, the two go hand in hand. And I think that's the key <coughs> when you think about corporate social responsibility is how is it that the two um, work well together? Uh, because you do have other perspectives, such as uh, Milton Friedman, who said, you know, that's a problem. So corporate social responsibility, because then corporations get off key. You know, they end up by doing things because they think they're doing good. Well, they shouldn't be worried about doing good. They should be doing their, their, their job well. That's the main job. And that certainly is key, that they do their job well. Um, but it's also, in my view, it's also possible to align operations uh, in ways that, uh, that yield more social benefit than otherwise. And now there's a unit in the uh, International Finance Corporation of the World Bank that has been going now for about six, eight years. They recently published a, a large document called Buried Treasure. And what they've done is gone through uh, hundreds of corporations and identified those ways in which the corporations have done things that have yielded uh, additional benefits to societies for, uh, from a social economic uh, development perspective. So now there are lots of examples to show uh, how that can happen. I won't go into any depth in these because I think all of you are acquainted with social process triangle and you've got the handouts and the purpose of that. But, you know, just to say that we divide the society into th three realms, they're interactive and they're interdependent and they're intended to be comprehensive of all of society. So that uh, uh, when you look at them, you understand all the dynamics. And people sometimes say, well, well, three? You know, what about technology? You know, what about this and what about that? Well, the point is, is that this encompasses all of those. And the reason why you want to stick to three if you can is because it ensures that you've got interdependency. Uh, and you can show the mutuality among all three together. They work together, and that's the essential part of understanding society. And this was a thing, I think, that was really uh, um, most innovative uh, of what, what the, um, the order did, uh, was uh, to develop the social process. And they, they took it down, uh, I don't recall exactly how many levels, but uh, it is six or so. And um, <laughs> this, just the second level is what I found is useful to work with. But you think in terms of a fractal. Uh, so the, the rationale is the same, that you've got uh, over here on the economic, sustainable, foundational goal of all of society, without which uh, society just disappears because there's no uh, food and, and uh, no way to sustain society. Then there's the organizational goal, that you've got to have decision making. Society has to make decisions, so that has to be part of it. And without that, it, uh, it disintegrates. And then there's a significant pull. That's the pull uh, that creates the identity, the value-laden part of society. And uh, that's essential because uh, without that, society just has no way of saying who it is. And, it, and you find societies that lose the ability to identify who they are. And uh, um, uh, Samuel Huntington, for instance, in this book, the class of civilization shows you how societies can be split and, uh, and, and, and can tear apart. So this becomes very important for keeping societies together. So these then, the important here is that we've got nine indicators, three economic indicators, uh, three political indicators, uh, order, justice, welfare, and three cultural indicators uh, the wisdom of society, how is it passed down from generation to generation, style, how do people engage and uh, act out uh, their, uh, their um, relationships, and then simple, what identifies the deepest yearnings, the sacred values uh, that, that society uh, identifies with. So, um, then what you can do is you can take that and for each of those nine, you can just uh, give it a definition about uh, these are some of the benchmarks. So uh, what does it mean to have a distribution system? Uh, what does it mean to have a resource base? And looking at it from the point of view of corporations. 
Now you can also look at it, and I'll show you another slide, and you can look at it in terms of societal stability or instability. But from a corporate point of view, corporations are interested in what are the quality of the inputs? What is the productivity? How can I get productivity if I establish my business? And then what about distribution? What, do I have market accessibility? Can I deliver my products the value I want to deliver? Um, in the political side, um, we, uh, corporations look at what is the legal base? If I locate there, is there predictability? Is there a rule of law in fact? What about policy making? Is there a new process? And is there stability in the, uh, in the uh, company, I mean, excuse me, in the country? And then six, the, uh, the sixth one is the social contact. That what is it that, uh, that government and, and citizens see is, is, uh, is the new? And uh, how is that acted out? So that's the record that turns out to be for a corporation looking at a country. Um, that is the regulatory claim. And then looking at a country from a cultural perspective, it's what is the workforce mindset? How do I get, how do I uh, enable uh, people to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to be productive? And, uh, and how can I enable my organization to learn and to transmit the knowledge? Uh, social relationships. Uh, when you look at a country, you say, "What? Well, how do they act? You know, is it a family-oriented? Is it uh, is it small small businesses working together? Uh, is it uh, family-oriented, uh, or is it larger businesses? And how how do they relate to uh, to stakeholders? So there's styles of interacting in any culture, any country culture, and then the sacred values of any country. What are the values that I need to respect? So I don't respect, you know, I won't make it with my company. So those are the kinds of things that a corporation needs to keep in it needs to keep in mind when it is trying to uh, adjust its um, the way it operates uh, to country culture. And there are just thousands of cases, and I'm sure you've heard of some. You know, where companies go in that. Uh, for instance, the United Parcel went into uh, Spain and they said, uh, okay, everyone wears a uniform and no smoking on the job. Well, it took about two weeks and the Spaniards just said, sorry, we're not doing this. We smoke and we wear what we want. <laughs> and uh, this is, uh, 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 there are, uh, you know, so gradually they had to negotiate. So, you know, it, things just don't always fit um, what you want. And uh, so anyway, it's, it's understanding the culture and how to deal with it that can be crucial. Um, oh, well, this I just want to say, another way you can adapt the social uh, process triangle is uh, in terms of instability in the year. You can, uh, and we you were asked it at one point, Randy was there, and uh, then Jim Weagle, and, uh, and Jim Watts, Jim Watts, and Early. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, to, uh, with a, a group in the Defense Department, because they're looking at societal instability. So we put this together to suggest using this as, you know, nine ways of talking about why societies might become unstable. And what are the, uh, how can you, uh, what are the indicators of that? So I won't go into that, but uh, just to show you that those are, uh, ways in which you can use those same uh, nine, in, uh, nine dynamics of the uh, social process to do that. Now, um, then later on in the uh, work of the of the uh, order of it uh, turned out, you know, it's you know, the social process triangle was built as a part of the local church church. You know, all may you know remember that, but then it took on a much bigger life. Um, and uh, then when we begin to work with the uh, with uh, corporations, we develop the corporate process triangle, and that's really a mirror image of society. So that uh, because what we discovered was that uh, our organizations have the same kind of dynamics, uh, except that you would give them slightly different names, because of course uh, organizations have a narrower scope, they have a narrower purpose, they have a more uh, limited uh, life in most cases. And, uh, but anyway, they have operations, 
they have a decision-making organizational structure, and they also have a culture. So you have the same kind of dynamics at work. Um, and uh, so you can also then develop the non-corporate process dynamics based on this, and related to resources, resource standards, uh, enhancing the productivity, delivering customer value, which is all about marketing, uh, under corporate organization, you've got to have administration or controlling systems, you have to have policy making, uh, and uh, there's a policy making process within every corporation, and there's mission. Uh, you know, what are the essential values? That's the very the same thing as a social compact in a, uh, in a society, mission plays that role in effect in, uh, uh, in, a, in a corporation. And then there's corporate culture. And every corporation has to engage in innovation, and, and has to train, enhance skills, and has to understand how people think and how they learn. Uh, and that's the way it improves the uh, workforce. And then there's style. Style is the way employees and stakeholders work together. What is the style? What are the relationships? And then identity, every organization has its own identity as to what is it that's essential uh, to our survival and uh, to thrive. So some of the challenges, I guess the important thing to keep in mind when you look at this juxtaposition is, you do in fact have two different perspectives at work. You have in the corporate process a fairly narrow perspective of surviving and trying to uh, make it, which means making a profit. So you know, that's the bottom line, is to make the profit. Uh, but to do that, you've got to deliver value. So you're trying to deliver value and make a profit, because if you don't make a profit, you don't survive. On the other hand, society is a much larger, much, more, much, much broader um, uh, set of uh, uh, perspectives. It's all public. And um, of course, it has other things at its disposal. It can tax. And it can inflate. Well, corporations can't really do that. Uh, if they can, if they're, if they're not making it, of course, our corporations in America, we just go to the legislature and we say, can we have some more money? Uh, and uh, so there are times you, uh, they get bailed out. But in fact, that doesn't normally happen. So, those are, so there's a tension. There's a tension between the private perspective and the social perspective. So the question is, it seems in corporate responsibility, is how can you, uh, how can companies shape their, their uh, processes so that they have the greatest uh, um, spin-off for society in addition to turning out a good product. <coughs> now, a good product is important, that's very important, central to them, but they're also, the point here is, there are eight other dynamics at work, and all of those can be brought to play for that. Purpose. So let's. Uh, so what are the, some of the challenges? Now you get back to Friedman's uh, perspective, and he's saying that well, it's all in the marketplace and uh, uh, the invisible hand. So you just everyone does whatever they do, and then suddenly this gradually comes together. Well, we know there are lots of reasons why that doesn't happen, and we're going through one right now uh, uh, through the, uh, the subprime tobacco and. Uh, so, sometime, so there are market imperfections. There are issues with balancing property rights because sometimes uh, uh, people's rights, such as uh, rights to, uh, to inventions and so forth, they're not recognized, they're not protected, they're not going to innovate, and they're not going to be motivated to innovate. There are biases in legal systems. Uh, some, you know, some people don't have access to legal systems and to the extent you don't have access to the legal system, you, know, you're, you, you, know, you don't have a, a due process either. Public policy limitations, we know public policy can be skewed in favor of vested interests, and, uh, and so it doesn't always end up as being public policy doesn't always mean it's in the best uh, interest of the, uh, of the country. There are dislocation effects because there's social economic exchange. So companies are always trying to come to grips with this. How do I deal with the fact that uh, you know, the workplace is changing, or that uh, people's uh, market preferences are changing, or that there's competition coming from all over around the world that I'm not quite aware of. And so there's constantly trying to grapple with that. And that means they can't always say, well, I'd like to help this, or I'd like to do that. So there's some limitations 
there. There are ethical norms, there's mistrust, there are low expectations. I mean, if you're in a society where everyone pays everybody else off, you know, you are kind of hamstrung. What are you going to do? You just don't pay off? Uh, or do you um, argue you pay off and just uh, take your lumps? And um, anyway, so there are these kinds of uh, ethical issues, and they're just plain short sighted and speculative decision making. Um, and there are n numerous books that have been written recently about how, why successful companies end up uh, uh, suddenly uh, uh, at the end of the road. And the reason is because they get so excited about their successes, they forget that something else is happening over here or over there. And uh, their products play out and uh, there are new competitors coming. Um, I think of Motorola and its mobile telephone, you know, and they were at the top of the world in mobile, and suddenly this company said, no, 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 what, no, key. And they weren't even mobile. They weren't even a telephone company. And they suddenly transformed themselves, and suddenly they're taking off and surpassing a, a, a long-time uh, multinational like, uh, like Motorola. So anyway, these are the kinds of constraints. So the, the issue is this. Um, uh, if we wanted to conduct a, uh, an audit process, uh, it's essentially four steps. The first step is, the company needs to clarify what its strategic imperative is. It's got to know that because if it doesn't link corporate social responsibility with strategic imperatives, they soon get lost. You get a new CEO and he goes off in that direction and uh, he's got his own pet things and uh, it turns into philanthropy and he, he finds somebody he likes and spends his little money here, a little money there or whatever. But that doesn't get to the basis of what how you get a company to be um, uh, responsible socially in terms of its operations. So it has to clarify what that is so companies need to know themselves. The next step is, is then to review the full range of societal needs that intersect with corporate activities. Uh, and so, you know, one of the best ways to do that is by looking at the stakeholders, identifying who you're working with, you know, the, the, your workforce, uh, you're, you're working also with, uh, with customers, uh, there's the government and government priorities, there are your suppliers, uh, and you can go through the whole gamut of what are called stakeholders, and you can ask, you know, where is it that what we do as a company in terms of our products and the way we uh, operate, how does that intersect with society and what are societal needs? Then we can look independently at society once again, using the social process triangle and saying, where are the pressing needs in society? And do any of our activities intersect with those pressing needs? And uh, there are always going to be some, but it needs to take into consideration that kind of a, a survey. And then they uh, shift from outside, looking inside. They systematically review all enterprise functions and activities, remembering that uh, the corporation is simply a mirror image, and its dynamics are essentially a mirror image of, uh, of the social process dynamics. And then after it has identified where it could, you know, where it might operate somewhat differently, or it changes activities uh, in order to influence the intersection of its activities with society, then it has to conduct a cost-benefit analysis, say, can I undertake those activities? So one example, I have this company that's recently doing some projects in India, and one of them is a plate glass company, and they decided they were going to hire locally. Um, and they hired they hire a lot locally. And one of the reasons is, well, we hire locally because when we hire someone from a family, that family sees that that person is there every day. They take responsibility for the breadwinner. And, uh, you know, it's, it's understanding that sort of enlightened self-interest, understanding why they want to engage uh, with, the, with the communities. And uh, also, Marianne and I were taking a trip to a tea plantation and, uh, with the CEO in the, uh, in the Himalayas, uh, who had responsibility for 12 villages and 380 acres of, uh, of tea in the in, uh, Darjeeling area. And, uh, you know, they bring in workers, but they have the workers have to live, and they and they have to make sure that uh, you know that everyone is 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 happy, 
and uh, and that those uh, you know those villages they have you know, all the benefits that are necessary for health care and for uh, education and so forth. So there are ways in which uh, corporations inter uh, interact and uh, and take responsibility for that uh, for uh, for society. So. Uh, I think at this point, I will just point you to the, uh, to the document you have in your hand and you'll see you can walk through the, uh, each of the dynamics. You can ask yourself, how does the corporation, uh, how does it interact, what can it do as it interacts with uh, uh, looking at its operations, how can it improve them? And you can see uh, in each of these examples, resource dynamic, production dynamic, and marketing dynamic, there are ways in which companies, and this is very general, companies can improve their, um, uh, it depends on the company, of course, and their situation, but ways that they could, um, they could improve their, um, uh, their operations, or maybe just shift their operations slightly. For instance, my example of Sears was, Sears was not even aware of what it was, it was just doing its business. But it was doing good, now, if the company knows the good it's doing, then it has the opportunity to expand that, uh, or uh, and others to learn from that. So I think it's equally important for companies to understand where they are impacting society in a uh, particularly constructive, effective way um, through their operations. And this is this is their operations. This is not just their product. It's the way they. Uh, um, and it's the way they work with industry to ensure transparency, to ensure, um, you know, that there are standards in the industry, um, decision making, um, you know, that they want to make sure that there are measurable outcomes. I mean, if, if they are serious about CSR, they should be measuring it. Uh, and they might even want to decide, well, let's work with business schools. Let's go over and lecture now and then. Let's show them what it really means to be, to do business well. Um, and, uh, you know, the mission dynamic, well, we, let's make sure that our labor standards are, are global, uh, at least SA. And then in culture, you know, uh, the learning dynamic, you know, let's make sure they upgrade skill levels. Uh, and that has an effect on society. And that maybe we should be recruiting from the less fortunate. Let's just not cherry pick, let's, let's have a training program. Uh, and once again, you've got to say, well, what's the cost of that? But at least you should be asking that question, can we do that? And we can encourage employees to pride and care. We can get our employees to get involved in the local community. And then the style dynamic. We should be thinking, what about codes of conduct? How do we build trust with our stakeholders? Uh, and let's encourage our employees to think that way too. And then finally, the identity. The identity. What is our pride? What is it that is distinctive about our company that makes us special? Um, so the benefits then of, of a CSR audit is uh, to identify existing corporate contributions, a certain pride in that, identify opportunities to better align the enterprise with societal needs, sensitize employees to their individual and the firm's potential contributions, because once employees know this and know you're interested, they'll give you feedback. And then identify collaborative possibilities with government and other stakeholders. Because if you have a solution to a social problem, maybe you can't do it by yourself. You say, well, let's get together with the others in the Chamber of Congress or the others in our industry, and let's see if we can address that. And uh, once again, all of these are to the uh, benefit both of society as well as the Thank you, Clancy. We're gonna we're gonna do a workshop <coughs> in just a few minutes, <coughs> and we're gonna uh, ask you to think about a couple of questions. Uh, one question is uh, that Clancy's gonna put this up. Can we turn that off? <coughs> uh, that uh, is the question of what is it that's blocking corporations or businesses from being more responsive to social needs. And by the way, Clancy mentioned that this process he just described can be applicable to a, to a business, a for-profit corporation, or it can be uh, applicable to a, 
I suppose, a large nonprofit. I also want to suggest that given the fact that most of the employment in our country comes from small business, that I believe it can also be very, very effective for small business, perhaps on a, on a, on a, on a different kind of a scale in the same way. So we're going to ask you to look at that then, and I assume all of you have an interest in, in finding answers to those two questions, or you're in the wrong group. Uh, but that there are two, two places where we might stand to answer that. Some of us stand within the business community itself. We are in business. Clancy uh, has been with, uh, with Sears. Uh, we've all worked for, for businesses. I happen to be, uh, along with my wife, the owner and operator of a small business. And so we have a particular vantage point that when we address those <coughs> questions, we're going to address them from that particular perspective. Some of you may be associated with a what I call a social sector, a nonprofit. It could be a faith-based organization. It could be a church. It could be some other organization where you're standing somewhat outside the context and you're still interested in seeing how you can leverage business to be more responsive to social needs, but from that perspective. And so, so the question, or the approach might be somewhat different. And uh, uh, as you get into the workshop and begin to try to answer those questions, it'll be interesting to see how you how you look at it from those two different perspectives. Whether you're you're trying to leverage uh, that kind of social responsiveness from inside the organization uh, as part of it, or from standing outside of it. Now. There are a couple that I have to say to you that in my interest in corporate social responsibility and bringing about change in business operations, there are a couple of, of uh, things I've had to come to grips with. And it's something like this. That number one, business is here to study. This is just to state the obvious. It's not going away. It's here to study. Number two, it's very, very powerful, which is to say it's going to have an influence and the third thing is that business is in fact a part of, not apart from, the social system. Uh, that economic dimension that Clancy put up on the social process triangle is part of it. It's not something drawn off to the side. So it's all there and it's going to have its impact and going to be impacted by both the political and the cultural of the whole thing. So, so two kinds of assumptions that I've had to really grip with for myself. One is to say to myself that business is not the enemy. That some of you will remember Joe used to say something like this. He said uh, that a revolutionary always defines, uh, 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 defines winning in her own terms and therefore she never loses. Remember that? Anybody remember that? Always define, uh, define uh, winning in your own terms therefore you never lose. Well, I've kind of taken that a step further in terms of business. That a revolutionary never calls anyone enemy whom he cannot beat. Does that make sense? Oh, so so why, why take on an enemy that you can't beat? So therefore, uh, uh, I'm going to assume that business is not the enemy. The second thing I want to I suggest that at least I've had to struggle with in terms of assuming, and Clancy certainly alluded to this to talk about it, but that is that profit is not a four-letter word. Uh, there, there is, there's nothing wrong with making a profit. As a matter of fact, uh, I would go so far as to say that nonprofit organizations have to make a profit. Uh, the only difference between not-for-profit and for-profit is how you distribute the, the surplus. That's the only difference whatsoever. And uh, uh, Doug, who's the, the, the president of the ICA board, and, and Karen, who, who is, does development for the ICA, understands full well that if the ICA does not bring in more money than it spends, which I think is the popular definition of profit, then the ICA ceases to exist. So that's as relevant for, that's as relevant for, uh, for non-profits as it is for for-profit for business. But, but the thing that, where it becomes a problem is when profit not only becomes the priority, but the only priority. And at that particular point in time, what happens is uh, companies begin to, uh, uh, the, they begin to uh, exploit markets, like uh, in developing products, for example, instead of asking the question, what, what, what is needed? They ask, what can we develop that we can sell? Uh, at, at, at a high margin, and then they do that sort of thing. Uh, and then they also exploit uh, and manipulate employees so that an employee becomes a headcount, uh, becomes a, 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 a piece of capital, it becomes a disposable uh, resource that gets used until it's worn out and it gets thrown out on the heap. Uh, and, and, and that's what happens. There have been several things, little adages, I think, that have been said about profit, and, and these things have been said by, in many cases, practicing business people. But, but uh, one was that uh, 
Uh, profit is no more the purpose of business than breathing is the purpose of life. And I kind of draw a distinction there between, I like to use the word and draw a distinction between vital and essential. That, that profit is vital to a business. Profit is absolutely vital. You've got to have a profit. But it's not of the essence. It's not of the essence of what the business is about. So the other little saying that I've heard, a little quote, is that the purpose of business is to serve and profit's the way you keep going. So I just want to, I just want to state those kinds of things in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, the stance towards business, in terms of those kinds of, uh, those kinds of options. Now, uh, Clancy mentioned, is there a black or something? Here's one. Clancy mentioned uh, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, and they're kind of two interesting little perspectives that I want to uh, contrast. IED. And Milton Friedman, uh, uh, in 1970, wasn't it, John, uh, wrote an article uh, that was published in the New York Times uh, magazine in which he essentially said that the social responsibility of business is to make a profit. Just period. Just to make a profit. And I'm going to give uh, I'm going to give Friedman a little bit of a benefit of the doubt there. Uh, I, I think what he was really alluding to was uh, some of the old uh, uh, adages we've heard. Uh, the thing about well, obviously Adam Smith's invisible hand, uh, but the uh, idea that uh, uh, that in a rising tide every boat rises. Well, somebody pointed out that assumes you've got a boat and that it doesn't have a hole in it. Uh, so there, there are some to whom that may not apply. So what he was really, I think, appealing to through that whole thing is what we've come to know since 1970. That's trickle-down economics, uh, that if you can amass enough uh, wealth at the top, some of it will, will, will slide down to the rest of the masses. But we've demonstrated, I think, uh, in our economic times, in our lifetime, that that really is not the case. It doesn't work like that. Uh, there were just a couple of other things that, uh, that Friedman said in his article that I found myself wanting to take issue with. Uh, one was he seemed to talk as if, and we've already addressed this, but as if business were somehow outside the social system <clears throat> and that it had no impact. And then when he was making his case for why uh, 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 money and expenditure should not be spent towards doing good things, he said because the, the, the owners of the company, the investors, the stockholders, uh, didn't give you permission to do that. And his assumption behind that was that the only people who have any skin in the game are the people who have invested money. Now, I got to thinking, I have a friend uh, who is a day trader, and he may own a significant piece of the company for a day or two or three days. And the assumption that he has more skin in the game than some guy who's, or woman who's been working for it for 35 years just doesn't jive with me. That there have to be some other people who have some kind of an indicative interest in the business beyond just people who have put money into it. Uh, uh, and, and there certainly are a lot of other people. We call all those people who are affected uh, by, the, uh, by, by, by the, uh, the way the business does business, as I refer to them, as we all do, as stakeholders. Now, there was another guy over on the other side of this in 1990, a guy named Willis Harmon. Anybody know Willis Harmon? Willis Harmon, uh, is, he was a Stanford Research Institute guy for a long time, but he actually... Uh, uh, was the co-founder of an organization called the World Business Academy, which I think is I think is still around in business. Uh, 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 Harmon himself passed away, I think, uh, uh, a few years ago. But in 1990, 20 years after Friedman, Willis Harmon made a statement where uh, that then eventually was showing up on the back cover of the uh, of the publication of the World Business Academy. They did a quarterly or something called Perspectives. And he, he said something like this. He said, at any time in history, <clears throat> the most powerful institution on the planet has had to take responsibility for the whole. And then he said, much as the church did in the Middle Ages. And then, the fact that he was writing in the latter half of the 20th century, he said, today, the most powerful institution on the planet is business. Now think about that just for a second. How could that be? That business, he said, has has the greatest of the technological resources, the intellectual resources, and the financial resources. That business has uh, the disbursement in terms of its global location spread all over the world. And the thing which he said, suggested, 
uh, that, that, that neither government nor, nor the nonprofits, and he, you know, I think he was talking particularly about the churches and education at that time, the, the thing that business has that none of them have is flexibility. That they don't have to ascribe to a bunch of rules and so forth and so on, that they can actually respond quickly. So Harmon's conclusion was that business, as the most powerful institution on the planet, has to take responsibility for the whole. And then they go on to spell out a lot of that. Now, what that struck me as somewhere between uh, that CSR uh, uh, is profit exclusively on this one side, and over here that, uh, that, that the, the responsibility of, of businesses or responsibility or stewardship for the whole uh, that there's got to be some kind of middle ground in this. Like, how, how would you ever, how would you ever bridge that gap? How would you move from one to the other? And it really struck me that I really appreciate all that that, that Willis Harmon uh, had to say that I'm aware of. Uh, and I'm, I'm really into idealism, but I think it's got to be pragmatic idealism. And I think that maybe there was a little bit of the pragmatic that was missing in this. And so what I want to propose very quickly for your consideration is that the best way to begin to leverage business to be more responsive to social need is to appeal to its sense of enlightened self-interest. And I want to say not to appeal to its sense of altruism. I mean, philanthropy is, is necessary, but that's not the primary influence that business has on social need. Uh, but, and not to appeal to its sense of moral rightness, but to appeal to the fact that social responsibility is good for business. It's good for business. Now, how would you how would you begin to make that make that kind of case in terms of of enlightened self interest? Well, what you're out to do, it strikes me in appealing to that sort of thing, is to say things that it's absolutely possible to do good and do well at the same time. And as a matter of fact, if you're thinking long term, probably that is the only way that you possibly can do that. So what I want to do is just just conclude by giving you some some quick kind of examples. First example I want to give you is, is an example of the way I've encountered the interconnectedness of business with the rest of the social system. Uh, I was the uh, executive for a chamber of commerce in a Dallas suburb for 12 years. And uh, uh, at the time that the population was growing rapidly, at the time it was about 55 or 60,000 people, we had a uh, federal uh, uh, job corps campus uh, in our town. And we had a good manufacturing base, and they had real need for their uh, for for entry level. They had entry level positions that were open, and so they really needed uh, for to have the people who had the skills that these young people in the job pool were being trained for. And so the whole theory has always been that you know all you need for job creation is a job open and somebody qualified to fill it. Well, these young people started coming out of the, out of the job corps uh, uh, program in, in our town in McKinney, which is just north of Dallas, and, but not taking those jobs. And nobody could figure out why. Until finally one day somebody looked around and said, the problem is, and keep in mind this is a town of 60,000, it wasn't a major metropolitan area. The problem was those kids can't find housing they can afford to live in in order to take those jobs and get to work every day. So the block in terms of jobs creation and people filling jobs in the community was affordable housing, which most people think is a social issue, not an economic issue. It went on to say, okay, well, if they can't live close, maybe they can just take, get, get, get transportation. There was no affordable transportation. Uh, we didn't have that plunkers for cash thing you know, back in those days. Uh, and so they, they didn't have, a well, that's just to say that there's a whole bevy of kinds of social issues that have an economic impact at the same time that economic issues are having a social impact. So if you want to fill those kinds of jobs with people who are going to make the smaller, the smaller wages, you've got to think of that in terms of affordable housing, you've got to think of it in terms of, of uh, transportation, you've got to think of it in terms of health care, you've got to think of it in terms of child care, uh, all those kinds of things. Now, when you're trying to get businesses to operate uh, in a socially responsible way, there are two things you like them to consider. One is that they do no harm. And uh, the one qualification I had for being a medical doctor was I cannot write. 
So oh, just, you just have, yeah. I know that. <laughs> I know that. Now you know that. So you just have to excuse that. But but do no harm. And 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 uh, there are two ways. This this group uh, on very treasure that Clancy talked about this. And there are two ways you can address that. One is with the process that you use to do your business, and the other is the product. Uh, there's a there's a book that the ICA board is reading, Doug, or did read, called, uh, what's that? Uh, the Practices of Highly Effective Yeah, non Practices of Highly Effective Nonprofits. And they talk about the way that nonprofits relate to, uh, <coughs> to business. And there's a story in there about uh, a company, a, a nonprofit organization, one of their, their high-impact nonprofits called Environmental Defense. Anybody familiar with that organization? I was not. High impact. Huh? <coughs> A uh, guy named Fred Krupp was the president, and this is talking to him. The story they were talking about was back in the early 80s when New York City was having its crisis about the disposal of garbage, and you know, they were putting it on barges out in the bay and stuff like this. And the, the, uh, the fast food organizations were taking a big public relations hit on that because they were being seen as the worst offenders in terms of, uh, of, uh, of creating a lot of different kinds of waste. And so uh, Crump in this book talks about the fact that he was uh, sitting in a McDonald's one day with his son sometime in the early 80s. And they were having a happy meal. And uh, he turned around and looked at all the uh, non-degradable kinds of materials they were using. And he said, you know, up until that time, the, uh, the attitude uh, of environmental defense towards business had been... Uh, one that they summarized informally as sue the bastards. And he said it dawned on him as he looked at that situation that maybe there was some way that environmental defense could partner with McDonald's and, uh, and get this situation changed a little bit. Well, the, the, the story is that uh, he did make that connection. They did create a partnership. And over the next 10 years, they helped McDonald's eliminate 150,000 tons of waste. Now, in that particular instance, the hit didn't go to the bottom line in terms of reducing costs, because the fact of the matter is it probably increased their cost because they had to substitute some different kinds of materials. But what it did do was help them in a very sensitive time improve their public image. And so they did that, and obviously at that point that becomes uh, uh, relevant to the bottom line. So anyway, let me just get on to a couple other quick examples in terms of uh, uh, that's the that's the do no harm. The other is that you can actually make a positive uh, contribution or impact uh, uh, on the social situation. And I want to tell you about a company I had the opportunity to work with. Uh, when I left Chicago in 1981, I moved to Minneapolis, and I was introduced to a man named uh, William C. Uh, Bill Norris. And Mr. Norris uh, had been the founder, was the founder at that time the uh, chairman of Control Data Corporation that was headquartered in Minneapolis. <laughs> uh, Control Data at that time had 57,000 employees uh, worldwide, and they were one of some of the original manufacturers of mainframe uh, of, of computer technology and stuff like that. But Mr. Norris had a very interesting uh, a business philosophy, which went like this, addressing society's unmet needs as business opportunities. Now, um, First blush, what that sounds to me like is here's a guy who's going to exploit human need for profit. But that wasn't basically what Mr. Norris was talking about. And what he was basically talking about, his vision was that number one, that he was going to serve underserved populations, and that he was going to do that by, uh, by creating products that were already needed rather than creating a product that nobody knew they need and then uh, that they needed and then create a, a, a huge expansive advertising campaign to convince them that they did. And we could go through a whole litany of products that are on the market today selling for very high prices and large margins of that uh, 15, five years ago, nobody knew they needed that. Now they can't live without it, whatever it might be. So he started that sort of thing. So when I went there, it was to work for a couple of uh, companies that he had created inside the company, one called Rural Ventures Incorporated and the other called City Ventures Corp. Which, by the way, what he did with those companies was he created a consortia of other concerns around uh, those. And uh, Rural Ventures, the one that I was with initially, not only had companies like Land Lakes because it had to do with agriculture and farming, but the, uh, the uh, St. Paul Diocese of the Catholic Church was a member of that consortium. 
And guess who else? The Institute of Cultural Affairs was a member of that consortium. Uh, and, and, and they were putting those things together. And what he was trying to do with, with, with control with, with, with rural ventures was he had come off a family farm in Nebraska. As a matter of fact, on the campus at Control Data, on the front campus there at the parking lot, he brought his windmill from off of his farm and had it on the parking lot there, which was just kind of a symbol of that. But his whole thing was he wanted to, he wanted to make small family farms and small agribusiness in rural communities viable, and he wanted to do that by using computer technology, which was, of course, what their, what their, their product was. He did the same thing uh, with City Venture. But what he practically, what he actually did there was that he uh, he started uh, building manufacturing plants in right torn inner city areas in order to deal with the problem of job creation, but to do it in such a way that the transportation and the housing and so forth and so on uh, were not an issue. There were just several other things he did. Uh, Control Data was having a lot of, uh, of uh, federal contracts at that time, and that was back in the time, and it may still be true when if you had a federal contract and you had to subcontract certain pieces of it out, there was a certain amount of that subcontracting required by law that you had to issue to minority-owned businesses. And so what Mr. Norris did was he began a program called Starco, where he was spinning off businesses out of control data to create minority-owned businesses that, that, that control data could then do business with in compliance with federal law in terms of the contracts they had. And uh, so he did that, and he created a bunch of small business incubators to put those people in that he called business and technology centers. And then in order to deal with the financing, he got a bunch of other captains of industry in the Minneapolis area together, and uh, he created a company called the Minnesota Seed Capital Fund. And what he was basically doing is they were trying to finance the startup of these new commercially viable businesses, but unlike venture capital funds, where a venture capitalist comes in and they own a, major a majority uh, 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 of the company. Uh, the Minnesota Seed Capital Fund uh, actually uh, did not take a majority position in the company. That they owned less than the majority of the stock, and then at the point where the business became profitable enough that it could buy the stock back, it did that. Uh, Mr. Norris raised $5 million to start that fund with, and in the first five years he had that money back and had raised another $5 million, which they reinvested in that sort of thing. But some of the other things he did, and I was just kind of looking at this, he, uh, he started some of America's first wind farms. Uh, he, he developed a computer education system uh, called Plato. Some of you may, I think it was one of the very, very first ones. And there were a bunch of other kinds of, kinds of uh, educational programs like that he did. And then he, he did a deal where he, he was, Control Data was one of the first companies to actually set up a corporate daycare program within the company to take care of the kids and workers of the company. It was just, just all those kinds of things. Uh, somebody may ask, well, what happened to Control Data Corporation because it's not around anymore. Uh, the demise of Control Data Corporation uh, ha occurred after the stockholders who didn't like, uh, uh, particularly care for what Mr. Norris was doing, decided to kick him upstairs. And then what happened is one of their spinoff businesses, which was mi not minority, anybody ever hear of Cray Research? Seymour Cray was one of uh, Mr. Norris's protégés, and uh, Seymour Cray went out and developed a better supercomputer uh, that was faster and less expensive than Control Data had done, and given that fact and the fact that they didn't really get into the PC uh, product uh, business quick enough was, uh, uh, was another reason, but it all had nothing to do with that kind of sense of what they were trying to get done. Now, I, there was one other thing. We're out of time, so I'm going to quit. But, but I wanted to just mention, on the paper I handed out, uh, which is not what I talked about, really, but on the very last, last page of it is something I, that I inserted just l lately. And what I want to just suggest from that is what I think we could do systematically in society, just, just is just a vision kind of thing, is what if we created some kind of what I call on that thing a partnership for the common good? And that, that we have all the social sectors, the social sector, the private sector, the public sector, all beginning to focus on that. And where I put uh, uh, up at the top accountability and down at the bottom transparency, that business is responsible to do just what it does, as we've described it in terms of this, this social, responsibility, social responsibility. Government has its responsibilities in terms of uh, things like uh, regulation, uh, things like safety nets, and so forth and so on. Uh, and then the social sector, and, and what I, I thought 
Peter Drucker had a key insight. You know, we, we refer to those as NGOs, NPOs. Drucker says you can't define something by what's not. So we got to say what it is. So he called it the social sector. That's good, bad, or whatever. I, so I just call it the social sector. But it's kind of interesting. Uh, we were talking so much earlier, Jack and I talked about this, that Paul Hawking, a couple of years ago, wrote this book called Blessed Unrest. Are you familiar with it? He said that there are essentially one million to two million many movements going on around the globe among these social sector organizations where they're actually trying through advocacy, through uh, education, through demonstration, and I don't mean sign waving demonstration, I mean demonstration projects like this organization understands, to begin to address and encourage and leverage uh, a business and government to get their act together and begin to work together. And so it seems to me that what I was trying to say with this diagram is that the responsibility of, of the social sector is to hold both the public sector and the private sector accountable. But let me let me remind you that what we mean by accountability always was not a was not a head head binding kind of accountability, but a way to enable people to come back and get their act together and go forward and do better. The transparency thing was another part of our understanding of what accountability was all about. That is, you remember we used to say that nobody can be held accountable to somebody else's decision about what they ought to do. They can only be held accountable for their decision about what they're going to do. So the transparency thing would be, for me, and particularly over on the uh, private sector poll, is for business to announce what it intends to do, what its public purpose in terms of its social responsibility is, and how it intends to carry, to carry forward on that, and then to report back in terms of how it's doing so that the, the social sector can, can then begin to, go, to hold that accountability uh, and that the transparency is there. That's just a thought. That's kind of a last throw in at the last minute. And let me stop now, but plans to get us working with our, uh, with our workshop. OK. Um, let's work in <coughs> two uh, things, maybe. That's having a couple of people from over there come over here. So we have two questions. Maybe one person. <laughs> and uh, pick up my chair. Here's the chair. So we'd like to uh, have two workshop questions, <laughs> and I think uh, what we're going to do is uh, spend uh, 15 minutes on each, and then discuss them. So we want to have some time left for discussion. So the first question: What is blocking corporations from responding to social needs? Just brainstorm what you think, and then consolidate that brainstorm into what you think of the, the main ones. So I would just say, when your group just brainstorm those, and come up with you know the top four or five, you know that you think, and then let's report out. So let's take uh, 15 minutes to do that, and then we'll proceed to the second part, which is to ask what can we do about it. So the first question now is, what is blocking corporations from responding to social needs? in these two groups. What is each in common words? Okay. Uh, if you can help me with the content here. Um, number one, it's not, it's not an articulated part of the corporate objectives. Okay, this is what is blocking corps from responding to societal needs. Mm -hmm. right? Not part of corporate objectives. That might come from the CEO, that mm -hmm. might come from a, uh, an understanding that what social responsibility is, is charity after the bottom line has been met, and so forth. Want anything else under that one? <coughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, number two is the industry short-term focus um, versus long-term. Um, so once again, if, in terms of social responsibility, this could be uh, a charity approach versus a long -term term in your best interest uh, approach to relating to society. Okay, in short term, just because that's the pressure of the, of the market. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so rivalries and competition. And third, uh, it has to do with the accountability of the corporate role. If nobody has raised any questions about why you're not doing something, you're not likely to put it on your agenda, your complicated agenda. 
Unless you've got a CEO who just cares and therefore will do stuff, nobody else calls people who don't care on it. When you say nobody, they won't do anything. I mean, there, there's a lot of people writing about corporate social responsibility, uh -huh. lots of people demanding it, and uh, you know. Well, but unless it's specific for your corporation and in the newspaper, I'm sure it's not going to get paid much attention to. I think it's, it's not consistent. It is not global. Today, corporations are very global. You know, if they have some accountability in the U.S., they just move their uh, uh -huh. operations to some other country where it is easier to do. Uh, if or you can't deal with the toxic waste stream, you can stop it. So it's the excuse if we do this. Yeah. Yeah. Else well, else so, the, so the accountability uh, is not consistent. It is not global, and therefore, you know, you can. There are a lot of ways you can escape yeah. the accountability. All right. Uh, okay. Um, we clustered ours in one, two, three, four ways. One was there's a sense of narrow perspective, narrow frameworks, like very limited means of measuring business impact, uh, narrow views of self or organizational interest. Um, and limited means. Limited means of measuring success. Well, measuring success or impact, yeah. And then, so this, this sort of a, a tunnel vision seemed to be one. And then the culture piece, the story, seemed very important. That um, there wasn't a corporate responsibility story there that was, what you said, consistent, um, impacting, uh, instead of fragmentary. Um, what are some other corporate ones mantra. on the story? <laughs> the corporate mantra doesn't include a social horizon, someone said. Um, no agreed upon goal other than making a profit. And always a pressure for growth. Mm, rigid hierarchical. And and we, yeah, we thought the rigid hierarchical structures and expectations where they exist are carrying on this old story. Um, then an, another one was that there was a no reflection on what someone called a second or, order story, which is sort of the story underneath the story, which included um, people actually not knowing how to change economic theory, at least in the U.S. Perhaps in <laughs> Europe, people are, and third world people are working more on it. But if you don't change the theory, how are you going to change the practices that flow from that theory and the people who are doing business are educated from that theory. Um, that the laws tend, national laws tend to reflect prevailing economic theory, which means old economic theory, status quo economic <coughs> theory. And so they're not going to predict or move the story or the practices forward. And then the collapse, a collapse of public accountability in general. So finally, there was a sense of uh, that narrow, uh, not story, but just short-term survival mentality that was closing out options and not, not considering a more in-depth, both-end approach. Any important points? You know, this thing we, talk, the thing we talk about is narrow. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, strikes me that what we're really talking about there is a kind of an isolationism. That, that business has decided to isolate itself from the rest of society and it operates out of, out of that out of that in a kind of a bunker mentality almost, which kind of relates back to the survival. But it's all out there. They are not we and they're out to get us. <laughs> I think Charles Sennett did very good with that elephant in the room thinking yeah. that the it's co two completely different moral metaphors. And w in one, the business s is the saint. And the reformer or the regulator is the sinner. To be protect the saint is to protect us from the sinner. And in the more liberal argument, the opposite. But neither of them are actually speaking to the deeper story. How do you see these, uh, these three and these four? Looks like there is some, um, some oh, kind of right. Not part of the, the 
that corporate objective, it looks like it's part of it's the story aspect, right? right. right. Yes. Um, industry short-term focus and versus so the short-term focus. That's the survivability mentality. Mm -hmm. And um, and this whole idea about uh, common standards of, for accountability, global. We said collapse of public accountability, but then we pushed it over to, into the whole economic theory, uh, rigidity of a present economic theory. You said no reflection on the second order story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is this is this account of, this is yeah. really the accountability aspect, right? Mm -hmm. That's not part of the the game. Or there's no common there, it's there's no common standards to to hold accountability. And uh, here that's we, we don't, don't have a thing. global I mean there's no global political system that could hold I mean within a country you have you know, we don't have a pure capitalist system or a cooperative system between government regulation and, and business that can that can theoretically anyway provide an accountability. But business is now a global operation and there isn't a comparable global structure that can hold that accountability. People just go some other place, move stuff offshore to Bermuda or wherever, where the local because local rules are basically what apply. You know, that's that doesn't have that. offshore either. It could just be from one town to another. Or one town to another, or one state. One state to another. Other reflections about these? There's something about the the being part of the corporate objective. I mean, there's this idea that social responsibility is nice. If you got some leftover profit, you can sort mm -hmm. of, you know, like a soup kitchen or something. Or you have a foundation that you fund and not a vision of how that's an intimate part of this product or service that's being offered. And that nobody's made the case to say that social responsibility is an element of com sustainable competitive advantage. Oh yeah, we, I'm, I'm reading the literature. Yeah, well, but it's not getting communicated, or, or it's not believed or something. Or it's not being, or short-term interests tend to outweigh long-term interests, so even though they know it's in their long-term interest and it is part of your sustainable competitive advantage, those things are given up sometimes. Maybe if process-wise, if we thought of it in terms of like that, what a wave, because it seems like some things are coming in, but they haven't hit yet. They haven't hit the beach yet. But other things are somehow, there's so many disincentives that they're not even on the, they're not on their way. So, so we'd say no to those, they're not there, but there is certainly some of this. Clancy, I think it's kind of, it was in that, that paper you talked about, the buried treasure thing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like everybody's paying lip service to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, you know, that, 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 that social responsibility uh -huh. is good for profits, but a lot of people are having a real hard time tracing that to the bottom line. Yeah, that's you know the scientific evidence is lacking a little bit in terms well, of that's that's also uh, one of the big pushes in uh, the research in this area is measurability. Yeah, yeah. because <laughs> it recognize unless you can measure it, you know, people can say, well, I don't know. Yeah, I think another block that has not show, not shown up here is uh, the frustration with the political system to address some of the uh, big social needs. What happens is, industry, and there's not like, uh, there isn't like nothing's going on. There's a lot of areas where industry is contributing to addressing the social needs. But one of the issues is, industry cannot do it alone. It, it has to work with the, uh, what do you call, the local political structures and political systems. A lot of the, if you really want to address social needs in a long-term way, there are a lot of policy changes have to be made. There are a lot of regulations have to be brought in. Our infrastructure has to be implemented in a lot of the places. That's where the needs are. Now, private sector cannot address that alone. It has to have the government working with it. And with the elections happening every two years, three years, four years, new politicians coming with the new agendas, new manifestos, political ideology changing every few years, 
things just don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And this happens a number of places, and I know it happens you know, in India when, where we have tried to work together, IT industry, trying to address some real deep social needs, and just grinds to a halt after one or two years because you just get frustrated that things are not moving. The industry just gives up. So, and that's a major block where you cannot really address social needs because structurally you cannot do anything without the government, you know, real participation, not mm -hmm. just the uh, uh, lip service. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a huge cultural question here, Cyprian, uh, because you and I spent, you know, so much of our work in, in India. Uh, the Indian concept of social responsibility is different than the West. Uh, Indian companies have a very strong sense, for instance, that they have a responsibility to care for the community in which they, re they reside. Almost every company will have villages, will have some kind of uh, <coughs> project, hospital, or what have you, that they see as integral to their work. Or you take somebody like the Tata Corporation, which I, what is it, 40 or 50 percent of their profits are all go to their social uh, uh, service, social needs. So there, the, the it, it's a very natural extension of what it means to be in business. Uh, now it's not always done well or uh, done effectively, but it is much easier to have a conversation about this or to catalyze or get something going uh, in India because it is seen as this is this is what you do. Uh, in the West, you often have uh, big barriers to moving in this area. So this is not a universal set of blocks. Um, well, also in countries like Germany, um, the, where the chambers are really functioning, and industry-wise, for instance, apprenticeship programs and so forth, they really mm -hmm. work together very carefully. Uh, so, you know, they'll agree among companies, will agree among themselves how many apprentices they're going to take this year, so that they make sure that everybody has a job uh, who's coming out and needs an apprenticeship. But also, Clancy, there isn't there, a, I'm trying to, uh, again, having not worked in the U.S. field other than what I've read, uh, but I, I think there are a number of corporations, for instance, who have just decided that they can no longer sit back and not do something about the education system mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the people they're getting can't do the job. And so there's new partnerships evolving in, in, in the whole education field. Yeah that the corporations decided this is in our interest to make the education system produce people that we can, we can hire. You know, interesting, interesting illustration of that. One of the big attractors to get companies to move to towns is tax abatements. There are some companies out there who, when they come to a town, will not accept a tax abatement from the school district mm -hmm. because they know they're going to depend upon what the school district produces to provide them qualified employees. Like what uh, Jack was saying, my company, we work with 40 engineering colleges in India to change the curriculum, the last year's curriculum, engineering curriculum. So we take engineering graduates, and most of them, even if we select the best, they're not uh, suitable to do what we want them to do. So today we are working with a consortium of engineering colleges to change the curriculum mm -hmm. and add some components to it. And, and it's long term, but uh, self-interest, as Randy was saying, and right to self-interest, but it is, it is changing the way uh, the schools are looking at what is education and what makes a successful professional, not just learning technology or coding, but rather teamwork, collaboration, good communication. So, yeah. yeah well, I'd venture to say that you can find examples this CSR working its way through a corporation. Hundreds of examples, I would think. You know, looking at the globe, and I think looking at buried treasures with the International Finance Corporation. That unit, I mean, the fact that there's a unit that's been functioning there for about eight years, to collect an advance, you know, in order to, you know, the basis for 
expanding and trying to show that, you know, this is doable, that kind of thing is going on. There are lots of examples of going on. But, uh, so, but, you know, there's a lot that still can be done. And I guess, uh, you know, these are three, and they, they, they relate to, you know, those two, the story, the narrow story, the kind of no responsibility story, the short term uh, survival mentality, um, and the ideology, the sort of second order story about how the economy functions. So it raises the question then, how could these blocks be addressed? Now we've already sort of touched on that a little bit, but I think it's worthwhile for us to huddle in our groups for, let's say, another um, well, we, we need to wrap up here five, right? Yeah, we have to, uh, we have to be downstairs. So why don't we spend 15 minutes in our group just talking about this second question. How could these blocks be addressed? And then we'll wrap it up in 15 minutes and just what kind of ideas are we coming up with? I'll just take 15 minutes in your group to discuss this second question. How could these blocks be addressed? And look at both of them box of both groups. Okay. Someone else uh, volunteer to do our initiatives, please. And we have everyone's attention over here, so <laughs> please someone oh, no, <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Well, how about you? Do you <laughs> have <laughs> two major emphases uh, is first it has to do with help the awakening folks who are there already in every organization but they're lonely, uh, isolated. Somehow finding ways to bring those together and perhaps help them with methods to be more effective, tools to stay spiritually sustained and connections with each other to be able to keep it going so to build a community. I was wondering and the other had, one had to do with expanding the context. innovative context or expanding the context where people can see beyond the borders of the business into the societal arena of responsibility. And one, uh, there were several vehicles to do the entry points. One was business schools, and notably five people in this room happen to be mm. teaching in such things. <laughs> and, uh, oh, we know. <laughs> The World Business Academy, for example, alliances mm -hmm. with groups of that sort, and then um, powerful business people as individuals who seem to be awakened and alert, um, but lacking the methods, the spiritual tools to be sustained, and the colleagues and so forth. That those might be three entry points to expanding context. Mm -hmm. Okay, we had uh, three one. Um, uh, finding ways for uh, companies which are more enlightened in this field to demand uh, and hold others accountable. For example, I'll give an example. Recently, uh, my company was bidding for a project for a bank, and the RFP request for proposal had a whole section on how are you acting out your social responsibility. Mm. Uh, they insisted the proposal be not submitted with any paper, and if it was paper, it has to be recycled paper. Mm. And this is for which bank? Uh, mm. I can't reveal the name for it. Uh, but I can't say the name. We can say it. Uh, 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 the national, you know what it is. So there are a number of uh, conditions put in it, which are very, very helpful. Not just, you know, economic, I mean, environment thing, gender diversity, uh, and all kinds of things. Energy efficiency, waste disposal, and everything under the sun. And we have actually show how it was all done. And we found it extremely helpful. And I think we were one of the things we discussed was how might we have a strategy where the more enlightened organizations, which there are plenty in the world, begin to put pressure, both structural and indirect, on others. So that's one. Second thing is using examples where companies have seen taking social responsibility does benefit on, you know, for both top line and bottom line on the long term. And using those examples as part of the education process. And that's what the IFC yeah. is. Yeah. Third, uh, 
we felt like it has to be part of the popular culture. It has to become a fad. Maybe it needs to get into the education system, like a number of things became part of the MBA curriculum, and those became part of the industry way of operating. So this might need to become that, or have uh, the popular, like the Tom Peters dynamic, we don't have anybody today like that, but if there were, and some, use this as part of their popular, popularizing this particular arena. So that's another strategy. Uh, I think the, the common aspect here is finding ways for uh, ensuring accountability. So defining standards mm -hmm. and then uh, and then uh, holding accountability. And uh, you know there are. Um, I think that's what's lead. I mean, what, what's happening with the ISC, and uh, I'm sure it will happen with the World Bank, and it will gradually happen. But organizations will begin to uh, to adopt these standards. I think is the there, there's a um, this in in the Scandinavian countries. I'm familiar with the, the there's a concept there of social responsibility accounting. So it's become part of the accounting standards, and as and accounting standards are moving much more toward being global GAAP. Uh, uh, accounting principles, and the more that that happens, there needs to, this this concept that's developed in the, the Scandinavian countries like Sweden and Norway. Uh, you know, it, that should be pushed to be part of a global accounting standard. Is that social accountability, uh, social accountability and responsibility be part of the accounting process? Well, there are uh, incidentally there are. I'm sure there are more than one. I don't know how many there are, but the, the conferences, annual conferences. On, Sustainability, in which uh, CSR yeah. plays a very big role, yeah. and the push is on measurability yeah. you know, to be able to demonstrate both the social impact as well as the business value. Yeah. So that's being pushed really very hard as a, a research side. And then the mm -hmm. question is, who's going to adopt these standards? Who's going to push them? And I think they are being adopted more internationally among international organizations yeah. gradually. Um, so the question is how to accelerate that, and I assume that the, the uh, CSR uh, unit for ICA is probably going to pursue that. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> okay, um, any final thoughts? we got five minutes to reflect on this, on this topic. I'd just like to reinforce this measurement idea, uh, to give an example. When, when Europe decided to come together, they made extensive use of uh, ISO 9000 9, standards. And there was one country that went way ahead of all the other <laughs> European countries, and that was England. And I asked somebody, why England? What's going on there? And they said, oh, there was a court case. And the court <laughs> ruled that if you're not an ISO 9000 uh, compliant, and you're prosecuted for some work or injury or something like that. The prima facie evidence is the company is responsible. Okay. So there are ways of enforcing these sort of measurement schemes. And, and there, on, on, the, on the persuasion side, there are things like the global Sullivan principles. The Sullivan principles were used in South Africa to get people to treat each other equally within companies, uh, to, to learn that they could do that. Uh, this is while well, apartheid was still in effect. And then Kofi Annan came up with his global compact, uh, which lists a set of standards like no child labor, uh, environmental responsibility, etc. And, and he's been trying to persuade all companies to buy into that schema. And there have been efforts to try to enforce that, which I don't think, as far as I know, are terribly successful so far. But there have been a lot of studies about it. They're trying to get business schools involved in, in enforcing the global compact. But, but I like the idea of quality awards. Uh, mm -hmm. Because what, the, the, the notion of the quality award is just, if, if you're trying to deal with a company and you don't know anything about the company, then you just ask them, are you ISO 9000 certified? And if they are, you do business with them, and if they're not, you don't do business with them. So everybody becomes ISO 9000 certified, which means they have to get their act up to a certain standard. Well, you know, and uh, the leverage is really great when you consider how much money is spent publicly, if that were part of it, all contracts, to demonstrate how your company 
is socially responsible. I mean, if there are some specific criteria, that would be right. But I'm also reminded of, you know, like in the, in the, per, in the uh, purchase and sale of uh, so retail in the foods, particularly uh, fresh foods being sold in Europe, have to de have a country designation. Where are they coming from? And uh, you know, and you could you can you can designate these things as to whether you know also the producers. You know, are they CSR certified? Uh, so you know, those are the kind of certification could be major. Now, there's some dangers to that because it could you know <coughs> how you define CSR and uh, what does that mean? Does it mean that suddenly you need to dedicate so much of your your profit to it, or is it, uh, how is it going to be defined? So, uh, but I know mm -hmm. that's really the issue. It's been no interesting. Other thoughts? Okay. Just one yeah. other thought. Um, there is some research going on now on the supply chains uh, because there's so much offshoring of production. Uh, and companies can make the case, oh, I didn't know they were using child labor. Uh, but then the question is, how far down the supply chain do you investigate who your partners are? And, and the worry is that the first partner you deal with is okay, but then the next partner isn't. And so they're beginning to do research on how do you cope with that supply chain. So they're here. Somewhere in the line, somebody is misbehaving. And you want to keep the whole supply chain up to speed. One of the, one of the innovations that the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, I don't know how many of you are familiar with them, but uh, this is a coalition that very much participant-led uh, of uh, tomato pickers and fruit pickers in Central Florida. And um, the growers, are just impossible to deal with. Uh, and so the coalition has gone over the heads to Taco Bell and Yum Corporation oh, yeah. and so forth. And uh, the, uh, the scheme is that companies that would respond positively would agree that pickers would get one cent per pound more uh, for picking, uh, if you join into the uh, consortium, which means that one, pin, one cent per pound, and uh, the pickers have a right to raise questions about the working uh, conditions. You know, they sometimes they have to pick right after a field has been uh, sprayed with pesticide, um, and. Things are pretty awful in the tomato picking area. There are seven people in federal penitentiary under slavery charges. If you really want to continue to lower the cost of picking, down there at the bottom is slavery. But also a number of organizations, organizations like the Forest Service Council, don't prefer them, but they work with uh, Home Depot and Lowe's and others to make sure that the forest, that the lumber they use is uh, is lumber that is uh, not taken from well, certain types of forests and that kind of thing. But also in terms of uh, regulating the uh, the working conditions. So you know, initially, I mean, it's an activist group, but they managed to right. build it to then ultimately uh, uh, co-opt or at least get the others to join in. So there are a lot of initiatives going on. Okay, what's uh let's see from here on where I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah.